Hey everybody, here we are. You have made it to Beneath Your Feet. My name is Derek, aka Shoreless, and I am so thrilled to be streaming for you all tonight. We're going to have a big night, big night tonight, big show, big show. Uh, we are going to be talking about dwarves, if you can believe it. Uh, we'll get to that in just a second. just want to welcome everybody to Beneath Your Feet. I'm so excited that you've joined me here for the show tonight. This is my monthly, we call it a research stream for uh, the Beneath Your Feet podcast. And in case you missed it, the Beneath Your Feet podcast is my semi-regular uh, monthly, you know, sometimes we take eight years off here and there, but semi-regular podcast where we explore uh, Middle Earth through the lens of the Lord of the Rings online. And um, through this stream, we take about an hour to explore around a particular area that I'm getting ready to discuss on my next podcast episode. And uh, we look for Easter eggs, we talk lore, we try to just see what we can see, and we generally have a good time doing so. So, let's see. Uh, you may wonder where I am, what's going on here. We are here in the beautiful Mirror Mirror on Landreval server. We are looking at the stars as reflected in the Keled Zaram, the Mirror Mirror, a very historic and important body of water here in Middle Earth. Um, but why are we talking about this? Well, we're talking about this because tonight we are going to delve deeply and greedily into uh, Moria. And you might be thinking, well, dude, last month, didn't you didn't you do Elder Slade last month? And I would say to that, uh, yeah, I definitely did Elder Slade last month. Uh, but the reason why we are doing Moria tonight is twofold, which I shall get to. In just a second. First, I want to check in with the, ch the chat and say hey to uh, Poteen. Welcome. Thanks for stopping by. Hang out with us for a little while. We're going to talk dwarves. Speaking of dwarves, we are playing on... What is this? No, 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 no. This is not... Get out of here. We are playing on... Sorry sorry for the interruption, folks. We are playing on Usi tonight. Usi, say hello. Uh, Usi is my brawler. In case you missed it, just a few weeks ago, they launched the brawler class here in the Lord of the Rings online. And uh, it's absurd, but it's also absurdly fun. So I immediately used my Fate of Gundabad pre-order uh, Valar level up to get Usi here uh, to 130. Still kind of getting a feel for it. Still spending a little time on Treebeard. Still spending a little time on Landreval, trying to get ready for the Fate of Gundabad. But the time I have put into uh, Usi here has been ridiculously fun i mean like first of all where are we we're at durin stone and we've got all these urix and orcs hanging around here we can't have that i just, just i get so mad i just want to punch him in the face and luckily i can just punch him in the face because that's what the brawler class does so usi usi is our stat x brawler he's uh grim of face but he's got a kind disposition and, and and a gentle touch so maybe if you see him hanging around punching things on landreval you'll stop and say hey um, Usi, interestingly enough, that name Usi, U-S-I, is one of the few that has stuck around with me since the beta slash, um, Shadows of Angmar days. Uh, so, I've been through many a character. I am, I, like many of you, I am a recovering alcoholic, and, um, I've been through literally dozens of characters. But for some reason, that name Usi, just three letters, U-S-I has always stuck with me as a fantastic dwarf name. So I've, I've held on to that one, even when I wasn't actively playing a dwarf character. I think what it was, is when I first got into the game, I was into a lot of Viking metal at the time. Still am, more or less. And uh, that song came up in a, or that name came up in a song by a band, Charisus, which you may have heard of. Um, so, what's up, Sargareth? Yes, Stark are the waters of Keled Zaram. You are 100% correct on that one. Um, but we're, we're, we're all a little, if you're like me, you're a little bit dwarfed out at this point. Um, let's see if we can get a good look at the statue here while I ramble for a little while. You might be feeling a little bit dwarfed out like me because really the dwarves have been a focus of, what is this? Bud, you're not welcome here. The dwarves have been the focus of the main storylines of the Lord of the Rings online since, since 2018. And you might be thinking, well, the legacy of the of Durin and the Longbeards. Was that the right is that the right title? The Legacy of Durin and the Fate of the Longbeards? Whatever. The epics the current epic storyline. 
uh, happened uh, back in 2020, just last year, with the release of the Mists of Wilderland expansion and the Wells of Lang Flood region. But don't forget, the first time we meet during the 7th in um, Yarns Fast in the Iron Fold was back in 2018. So really, Durin and the Dwarves have been the focus of our epic story since 2018. That's like three years now. Okay, we're coming up on three years. And so I'm a little bit dwarfed out. You might be a little bit dwarfed out, but we got to we gotta just keep it rolling. We got to keep the, the hammer of the dwarves ringing at least until next month uh, when the fate of Gundabad drops like a Kanye album. And um, cheers, by the way. And um, I assume the dwarf storyline will kind of be wrapped up by then. And uh, so anyways, I was a little bit like, ah, do I want to do Moria? Do I not want to do more dwarves? I don't know. Um, oh, wait a second. We got some raiders jumping in here. We'll come back to that in a second. So anyway, I was a little bit torn. I wasn't exactly sure how I wanted to, to do this. And if I wanted to do more dwarf stuff, since we did do Elder Slade last time. Um, but then, I, so what I did was I posed it to you all. Oh, shout out. Shout out Anxiety XP. Welcome everyone. Thank you Anxiety XP for the raid. We appreciate it. Welcome one and everyone. We're talking. To, uh oh, hold on. Get what is this guy doing here? Get off my block. Ugh. As I was saying, we're talking dwarves today because in just a few weeks, the Fate of Gundabad expansion is going to be launching here in the Lord of the Rings Online. And I thought ah, more dwarves. I don't know. I mean, my, I'm a shorn beard here. I don't know about this. So what did I do? I posed it to you good people out there on Twitter. By the way, if you're not hip to Lotro Twitter, you need to get after it. That's where all the fun is happening. Uh, and I put it out on a poll and what should happen. But right there, Moria and a pub crawl tied at 28.6%. At, at <laughs> That's a very specific percent. Uh, but we do it by the numbers here. And so when I had, uh, there was the coin toss between we go to Moria, we could do a pub crawl. Um, as I said, cheers, by the way, to all of our, our newcomers here from the raid. Um, I said, let's go to Moria. We'll have one last hurrah with the dwarves before we, we wrap it up. Um, uh, yes, don't forget our good friend Ald Eldaleth is the one who runs Lotro family on Twitter. Um, so anyway... Where was I? Yes, so I, I, I said, let's just do Moria. Let's just go for it. But when I do the Beneath Your Feet podcast, sometimes uh, I like to change it up a little bit. Sometimes we'll do an entire zone. Sometimes we'll do a little part of a zone. And so what I'm thinking tonight, my big idea for tonight, is to do a little research on the Endless Stair. Yes, the Endless Stair. Um, but the, the trouble with that is that it's a very minute piece of history in Middle-earth. Uh, there's not a lot to be said, but we can get a very good look at it here in the Lord of the Rings Online. Uh, I will also add that this, uh, as I said, I Valard um, this character, and so I don't have a lot of mounts, uh, waypoints, stable masters. And so we're going to be doing a lot of drive in here tonight. So I could have used my Burglar, my Bjorning, my main characters, and zipped around a little bit quicker, but we're going to go exploring with Usi here. Uh, so we're going to knock out two things. We're going to do some research for the stream. We're going to get some stable masters for Usi, and we're going to have a good time. All right. Uh, so shout out to El Galadwin. Oh, yes, Moria. And Ski0624, thanks for being here. Uh, let's have a look at beautiful Kelid Zaran for a second, because uh, I think what we'll do tonight is talk a little bit about Moria as a whole, and then we'll shake a leg and head down and do a little bit of uh, research on the endless stair yeah El Galadwin, i'm glad you mentioned that the moria battle cry that is definitely one of the the meanest awesomest parts of the hobbit so let's talk about moria the the quenta silmarillion teaches us that the greatest of all the mansions of the dwarves was casa doom the dweradelf hathadrond in the elvish tongue that was afterwards in the days of its darkness called moria and we don't get a lot of details from the Silmarillion or the appendices, but we know for a fact that during the Deathless, during the first, the father of the Longbeards was the, the one who founded Casa Doom. And uh, if you were paying attention last month when we were in Elder Slade, I talked a little bit about how it was in Gundabad. You see, it was Gundabad where Durin awoke. And 
Uh, at a certain point, old, old boy got a little restless and began wandering around. And he came upon the lake that we are at right now in Kelid Zaram. And he saw the crown of stars reflected in its water, which is somewhere around here. I don't know. I did research, but <laughs> not enough to actually find where this thing is. Um, and he saw there. Yeah, let's go with that. He saw this crown of stars reflected in the water, and he named the, the water Kelid Zaram, which means the glass lake, since the reflection is so still and clear. Uh, in the common tongue, we call it the mirror mirror. And this place remained uh, a place of reverence for the dwarves. We get uh, 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 Gimli has to, remember in the fellowship they're being pursued by like a host of orcs. And Gimli's like, hold up, y'all. I got to see this. So even though his very life is in danger, Gimli holds this place in such high regard that he uh, has to um, pause and just take a look. Uh, Ginger's telling me there's a marker on the shore that I literally have not seen in 12 years of playing this game, which we'll, we'll look for later. Where is it, Ginger? We'll wait for him to respond while I, I yammer on a bit longer. Um, so anyway, he, uh, I guess Durinstone will be the marker, right? So at Durinstone, it's marked where Durin first found, uh, the mirror mirror. And from there, you know, Providence guided him into Kaza Doom. All right. So here we are at Durinstone. I can spend a lot of time on this because we really, folks, we got a lot of ground to cover. We can kind of see some of the stars that I was just referring to in a minute, a minute ago. All right, let's head in. Let's head back, head into the gates of Moria. The East Gate, as it were. So that's me talking a lot. How's everybody doing? Where are we at? It's Tuesday. Whew. The longest day of the week for me. So it's always good to break it up with a little bit of low true. There's, of course, the Dimrill Stairs. And we are in the Dale, the Valley of Azanul Bazaar, which I'll talk about here in a little while. But here we are at the East Gate of Moria. So after his, let's call it a revelation, at the Mirror Mirror, uh, Doran, we're not doing riddles. Doran founded the, we'll call it a nation, the mansion of Khazad-dûm. And it flourished. Well, how do we know it flourished? Here we are in Moria. We've made it. Don't let me forget to share you guys with that meme in a little while. It's pretty funny. Um... But how do we know it's famous? We know it's famous because in the Silmarillion, uh, we learn that the dwarves of Beleriand, which is very far to the west in uh, Nogorod and Belagost, knew about it. They were already aware of the riches and wonder of Moria. And when Beleriand was finally sundered at the end of the First Age, those dwarves of Nogrod and Belagost and the other dwarf homes fled. They came to Kanza Doom and increased its population. Um... And the wonder of Khazad Doom grew, and I think really uh, our friends at Turbine, Standing Stone Games, nay Turbine, did a really good job of capturing some of that majesty, as we're going to see. That's partly why I wanted to take um, this kind of newbie character through. We'll take the slow way, although I should probably mount up on my go, shouldn't I? Because if you're an old head like me, then you remember how uh, back in the day, day, um, we were all excited about Moria. It was the biggest uh, expansion of its kind. Because nothing had really been done before with this type of interior locale, to my knowledge anyway. And I've played MMOs for a long time. And so I don't believe there had been an MMO up until that point that really did this an entire expansion that was going to be an interior in this case, underground uh, location. I mean, look at that. And so as we travel around, and especially if you're for first timers, um, it's just like jaw drop after jaw drop 
as our as our friends in England might say, we, we were gobsmacked. Um, and there's lots of great details like this. We're at the eastern arch of the bridge. Don't want to fall down, though we are going to take the long way down there fairly soon. But we're just treated to, to wonder after wonder here. I will go ahead and put this spoiler out. Uh, yeah, those stone trees are nuts. They're so cool. And I actually like that they reused that zone in the second hall for um, the Fall of Khazad Doom raid, which I'll talk about in a minute. So where were we? So the um, Khazad Doom continued to flourish into the Second Age. And all the long beards and all the dwarves were drawn to it. And then this was about the time when they sort of completed uh, their build, if you like. And they reached the western end of the Misty Mountains. And when that happened, we, they built the western gate, which is the most famousest of the two gates, because Tolkien actually drew that one. Um, they made connection with the, the elves who were living in Eregion at that time. And um, this is one of the few times in history where the elves and the dwarves really got on. And they had a wonderful, flourishing relationship where they shared their lore, their craft lore, and all those kinds of uh, exciting things that uh, elves and dwarves are long to do. And this is, of course, part and parcel to the crafting of the Great Rings. But what happened after that? Well, uh, the elves did an oopsie. The elves... Excuse me. Cheers again. The elves... Um, were enchanted by a character named Anatar, the giver of gifts, who had a different name in Lotro. I'll leave it to uh, Eldaleth or Elgaldwin or one of the experts in the chat to remind us of the name that um, Lotro gives to Anatar at this time. Uh, but Anatar was, of course, the one who taught the, the elves uh, the great arts of, of ring making. No way to go here but down. And then, of course, spoiler alert, uh, Anatar is actually Sauron in his final uh, form, his final uh, beautiful form, before he could only become a Dark Lord. Thank you, old Godwin. Yes, Antheron is the name they gave him in um, The Lord of the Rings Online, because copyright. And so at a certain point, um, let me make sure I'm going the right way here, as I'm just kind of rambling. Yeah, we're going the right way. Uh, at a certain point, <clears throat> excuse me, the elves uh, figure that they crack the code. They figure out who this dude is. And um, he's not too happy about it. And so he comes with his armies and begins wreaking havoc all through Eregion and the Western lands. And the dwarves are like, nah, bruh, you can't do our homies like that. And they and an army of dwarves leaves out of the Western gate of Khazad Doom to defend its uh, elvish allies and um, believe it or not Sauron wasn't real wasn't real happy about that and so from that point forward if, it, if there weren't uh, such a grudge and enmity already uh, Sauron bore a great grudge towards the long beards and the dwarves of khazad in particular and um, told his armies of orcs to harry the harry the, the dwarves whenever he could and so what did they do? Well, they do what, what orcs like to do. And they start sacking things. And they sack Gundabad. And they make life all the more difficult here in Khazad Doom. But it wasn't until... This was about the, the end of the Second Age. It wasn't until the middle... I guess it was the middle of the Second Age. And it wasn't until the middle of the Third Age until things really got hairy um, in Khazad Doom for the dwarves, which we'll talk about very soon. Uh, I mentioned... I said spoiler alert earlier. I'm going to repeat myself. Spoiler alert. If you if you have not played uh, through Volume Two of the Lord of the Rings Online, I'm gonna I'm just gonna just gonna tell you right now we're gonna be hitting a lot of spoilers. Um, we're gonna get into it, so be advised. We're gonna talk a lot about what happens in um, the the main epic story here in just a minute. If I can find my way down. 
here we are. Yeah, this is another great spot. You know, you can imagine the design process with this whole deal where they're like, how do we differentiate these different underground areas? Well, lighting is a huge part. Um, I also previously did a podcast and a blog called Tavern Hunter where um, I was just obsessed with tavern games last year and I kind of had to get it out of my system. And so I, I, I still kind of run it. It's kind of on the back burner now. But for a while there, I was kicking out a bunch of podcast episodes and I was lucky enough to have... There we go. That's what we're looking for. I was lucky enough to have um, Scenario, Matt Elliott, on the show. And um, we talked about the inns and taverns of Middle Earth, which I think we're going to do next month. That might be next month's stream. And we talked about... Um, he talked. He has a fine arts background. And he talked about the importance of lighting in these taverns. And um, I think that's what they did in Moria. It's just lighting that makes it all worthwhile. Okay, so here we are. This is our first glimpse of the endless stair. We're gonna uh, we're gonna go all the way down to the foundations of stone to get a proper look at it. But you can kind of get an idea here for just how massive this thing here is. Thank you, Eldeleth. Yeah, Werewolf Blood, uh, new to Lotro stream, not new to the Lord of the Rings online. So, let's get back to our main story here. Is this the way down? I probably sound new because I haven't run around Moria in a long time. I made, th <laughs> I made things difficult on myself by um, playing this on one of my newer characters so I don't have all the horse routes but at least you guys get a good tour of Casa Doom as we leave the second hall and Nud Melek and head down to the maw of the foundations of stone yes I wonder um, just a sidebar here I've been very deliberate about does this take us to the foundations of stone are you my goat Yes, this is my goat. We're going to... Come on, buddy. Let's go. I've been very deliberate about not watching any of the streams that are kind of... Um, that are um, previewing some of the beta footage of... Um, here we go. Of um, Gundabad. But, you know, it's pretty clear that it's going to be similar to like a Moria 2.0. And so I very much look forward to getting lost again uh, as we all did when we first started playing moria um so let's get back to our our story here in um yeah i'm fully stoked on good to bad yeah el galadwin says that she wants it to be a surprise and i definitely do as well so that's why i've been dodging some of the beta footage. This will be our little baby, our baby Gundabed. Uh, but anyway, so second age, Sauron gets mad. The dwarves say, "Well, all right," and the way is shut. The doors, the western doors and eastern doors of Casa Doom are closed to outsiders um, for a very long time. Elotro alludes to this in about this part of the story, where. Um, I'm going to have to yeet this. Sorry, fam. Oh! Where a company of elves is brought into these the lower parts of Casa Doom. And the elves are like, are you sure you should be digging this deep? And uh, the Durin of that time, I can't remember which one he is, is like, yeah, it's fine. But then, of course, that is the point at which, uh, after literally centuries of digging... Okay, here's another sidebar. I was thinking about this today, uh, but what could we possibly compare Kaza Doom to here in our primary world. There's really nothing, by the way. Uh, that, this is That's the fantasy part of um, The Lord of the Rings. There's, there's literally nothing we can compare uh, this type of structure to. But I learned that the deepest we've ever dug as a human species was uh, during the Cold War, of course. The Soviet Union dug... Um, Hold on, I have it in my notes. Because it's that interesting. They dug... 
40,000 feet down. It's called the Cola Super Deep Borehole, which is a great band name, by the way. So if you want to start a band called the Cola Super Deep Borehole, I'm down. Uh, these Russians dug until it hit about 180 degrees Fahrenheit. They got that deep, and then they had to kind of <laughs> they had to tap the brakes. Um, now I don't know how deep the endless stair is, which you see lurking ominously in the background there, but it's pretty deep. It's pretty deep, especially when you consider that they, these are dwarves with just mattox and uh, pickaxes and things like that. A little deep. Um, but remember, this is uh, an entire nation, an entire population of dwarves digging for literally thousands of years. But that also got me thinking, what was the longest running human endeavor? It turns out, anybody want to guess in the chat? What was the longest running construction act by humans in history? I have no loader points to give you, but I'll at least give you a, uh, a thumbs up. It's Andang! Shout out Andang! Welcome to the stream, pal. Do you, do you sir, do you know uh, the longest hu uh, human building project in history? <laughs> <laughs> El Galadwin says Thornley's worksite. No, surprise. It's actually that that Hobbit pub that's been being built. All right, I'm giving you guys a couple seconds. Then I'm going to spill the beans. Then I'm going to talk about what in the actual heck is happening down here at the bottom of the world. Adso's. Thank you, Ginger. Yeah, it's Adso's work camp. That's hilarious. It's actually the Great Wall of China. So Great Wall of China was being built intermittently over about 2,000 years. So if you get into, um, you know, you start thinking about generational projects like that. Casa Doom is a massively generational project. Literally, um, excuse me, literally hundreds of generations of dwarves have been hacking away at this thing for since the beginning of time, basically. Um... And the whole time, they're pretty much digging for mithril. So in about the middle of the Third Age, about 1980 of the Third Age, these dwarves are hacking away at the Earth. And um, again, I like Lotro's version of the story because they're literally like doing a tour for these uh, the elves of Lothlorien. Like, check, come check out my crib. Don't worry, there's no Balrogs here. Psych, there's a Balrog. And so when they delved too, gr too deeply and too greedily, uh, they struck pay dirt. But Psych, it was a Balrog. And um, at that point, Durin's Bane, as we all know, wreaked havoc upon Casa Doom. And our poor dwarf friends had to flee. And Casa Doom was abandoned. Yes. Andang makes a great point. Because they were hacking, the devs spawned a Balrog. Yeah. <laughs> it's so meta. Uh, Eldaleth, you want to give us a thank you right on cue, Eldaleth. I appreciate that. Yeah, they were hacking, so the devs, aka Eru Aluvatar, spawned a Balrog and kicked him out, which it was perfect timing because really that's what this whole year of content has been about, at least since the summer. Uh, yes, Dancing Pigs, thank you. Uh, because this summer we got the Blood of Azog update, which included both the story of how the massive army of dwarves during the War of Dwarves and Orcs could not re uh, retake Moria because Don was so shook after seeing Durin's Bane. We also get to participate in the fall of Khazad Doom as uh, warriors, I guess, sort of helping the dwarves in some fashion. It doesn't. Don't overthink it, guys. Don't overthink it. So we really got that whole story wrapped up in a nice uh, nutshell. Okay, so I've been yammering for a while, and in that time, we have actually reached. The Endless Stare. And I think this is what I want to talk about on the podcast this month because it's just so interesting. It's so bloody interesting. They went from literally the bottom of the world. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if we can see Gandalf's hat. They go from the bottom of the world here up to the top of the Misty Mountains, which are the tallest mountains in Middle Earth. Where's that island? So I think it's over here. You guys can see my cursor. Over there, I think that's the island where you can find Gandalf's hat. 
because of course the entirety of the Moria story in the Lord of the Rings Online is hinges on uh, the passing of the Fellowship. So let me climb. Let me get to the stop here, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that too. So what is the deal? You guys help me out. What is the deal exactly with all the uh, the creatures that we find here in Moria? Because the nameless things, that's straight out of the book, right? Uh, Gandalf specifically mentions, calls them nameless things. And they've been iterated on since um, the dawn of Lord of the Rings gaming. But then we see like the Gwen... Hold on, Gwendoleth, Gwen, Gwendrath, that big weird looking demon thing, and the uh, the two like uh, ancient evil guys that we fight at the bottom there. You can tell I've done my research because I I can remember I could definitely remember all these weird elvish names. So what are those supposed to be? Are those like lesser Balrogs? Are they just like evil spirits that SSG created? Anybody know off the top of their heads? While you guys are thinking, that's the bottom of the endless stair. So as I said, this is a thousand, multiple thousand year project that the dwarves have been working on. And at a certain point, some genius was like, you know what, let's do, let's build a stair from the bottom of the earth to the top of the earth. Did that sound like a good idea? And the dwarves were like, shoot, yeah, I'm down. I'm bored. We shut the gates because those crazy elves got us in trouble. And that's what we have here. And I've tried crossing this many a time. There's not a good way across, so we're just gonna we're just gonna hoof it all the way around the lake and start making our way to the top of the endless stair here. Okay, so um, yeah, there's the glob snaga. So let's walk and talk. As I was saying, the entirety of the volume two Moria story is based on what happens after the Fellowship gets through Moria right? Um, we learn in the books a few different things. We learn that uh, one Aragorn, son of Arathorn, actually passed this way for some reason. The reason is never explained to us. And then, of course, the story goes that as the Fellowship passed through, they caused all kind of ruckus. Things seemed to be going just fine until they reached... Um, the, the Chamber of the Crossroads, what they call the Chamber of the Crossroads in the Lord of the Rings Online, and then the Chamber of Mazarbul. And who could forget that most memorable scene in the books and the films where Mr. Peregrine Took um, does a oopsie and <laughs> draws a lot of attention under the Fellowship, which is uh, reaped in the Chamber of Mazarbul where they're attacked, which is another famous scene. Say it with me. They have a cave. Oh, they have a cave troll. And then, of course, most famously, they get all the way to the eastern side of Moria. And on the bridge of khaz doom Gandalf very valiantly uh, gives himself up in defense of his friends. And the Balrog of Morgoth latches onto his ankle and drags him down to right about here at the Foundations of Stone. They then fight. There's a great swashbuckling match between Gandalf and the Balrog. And they fight literally all the way up the endless stair, which we can see in the background here. And that's another one. There it is. Yeah, perfect shot. Let me get a, let me get a screen grab of that to use later. Oh, so perfect. All right. So anyway, they fight all the way to the top, which we're going to now, which we'll hopefully get to before we're out of time. And um, yes, I would like a ride, please. Thank you, sir. You're very kind. And um, I was trying to decide if I wanted to take a goat here. I don't think I'm going to. I think I'm just going to leg it. We need to yeet this. That's too far down. So they eventually get out. The Fellowship leaves. And um, when we arrive, we find that there are a pack of dwarves from the Iron Hills come to figure out what's happened with poor old Balin. I guess word hasn't got to them yet that Balin's dead. Sorry. And um, we, we follow along with these dwarves. We try to help them on their adventures. And eventually we end up down here. And uh, what we come to find out is that in the wake of the Fellowship kind of kicking the hornet's nest, so to speak, 
we've got all these orcs milling around in Moria, and we've got nameless things, as we just saw, kicking around. We've got these fungi, whatever in the world they are, infesting all the orcs, creating what we call the Globshnaga orcs. And um, they are somehow connected to the nameless. And then on top of all that, to make things worse, we've got a interloping... Sorry, let me make sure I'm going the right way here. We've got an interloping um, sorcerer from Dol Guldur who's making everything uh, so much worse. And, of course, the uh, mess is left to us heroes to clean up. Um, but what appears to be happening as we go through Volume 2 is that uh, this particular sorcerer... Am I going the right way here? Hello, friend. This particular sorcerer is trying to kind of harness the power and fill that power vacuum that was left by the defeat of Durin's Bane by Gandalf. We got... Uh, Azog the orc, um, the orc chieftain, who is um, trying to rally all the dwarves to his cause. We've got, uh, as I said, Gorathul the sorcerer from um, Dal Guldur, who is getting involved. And uh, basically everyone is just trying to do what they can to seize power here in uh, Moria. And then that's kind of where we show up. Love, love, love this shot right here. Here we are on the beautiful red horn loads. Let's take a pause here real quick. Catch our breath. Okay. All right, let's keep it rolling here. Very good. Hello, neighbor. Anyway, that brings us back around to the topic of the endless stare, which is just kind of a fascination of mind. Alties camp. Now we're not going that way, uh, because it's again a. Yeah, let's go. It's uh, I mean, try to wrap your head around that. It's a stare that goes from the bottom of the world to the top. Um. And if you've ever played Dwarf Fortress, I don't know how many of you ever played Dwarf Fortress, but that became a goal of mine when I was playing that game. And in Dwarf Fortress, you basically like um, construct your own Casa Doom, and um, you tab between the different levels. So that was something I always did when I played that game. Was I would always build a stairwell that goes from the bottom to the top just because it's so weird and interesting okay i'm gonna cheat a little bit here and just take a slow coach up to 21st hall because i don't think you guys are wanting to see me get what uh, lost too bad we're just going to use a mithril coin there so if any of you here let me put the image up for you guys uh hopefully some of you guys are familiar with the Atlas of Middle Earth by Karen Fonstad. And when you uh, read this, which you must, you will. You will see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you'll see that the Lotro team probably, probably brought a little bit uh, from this book. Ginger says, yeah, we all get lost in here. Some of us on purpose. Yeah, we don't have that kind of time. I like getting lost, but not, not that much. 
So anyway, Atlas of Middle Earth by Karen Fonstad. Excellent book. Uh, if you no doubt the Lotro team has it on um, on their shelves as they're as they're building this world. Uh, so have a look here. Hopefully I'm not hopefully I'm not getting in trouble with some kind of copyright. But this is her her map of uh, Moria. And I think there's a few things we can kind of glean from this as we continue our slow coach all through Moria. We can glean a few things from this. Number one, we can see why, like Ginger, we Ginger, we like to get lost and we end up getting lost in Moria because there's no vertical grade that's actually described um, in the game. It's there. As you can see, I'm climbing these stairs right now. Uh, Nunmelek, um but the map doesn't account for that, which makes sense because number one, it could be kind of confusing for a, a player, and number two, they didn't really have the means to do that in this like medieval fantasy setting. But there's very much a vertical, um, distinctive traveling through Moria, and so you kind of get the idea here. The endless stair starts in the abyss, the foundations of stone, where we just were. And it goes all the way up to the top of Zirak Zigil uh, Silvertein. Far above uh, the different the different gates. Which is pretty interesting. Very interesting indeed. Let me check one last thing here. Because I thought there was a different spot we could see. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. So you guys help me remember... Uh, the, the, the path at this point is to pop by the 21st hall through the stone hall into Yazirgun to Zirak Zigil. And I read, I'd never noticed this before, but I read on Lotro Wiki today that you can actually see bits of the Endless Stair in, um, this north part of Durin's Way. So we're going to keep an eye out for that. So you guys, y'all help me keep an eye out as well. All right. This is another great area, the Great Hall of Durin. And I don't, there's no throne or anything in this area, but the lighting and the pillars and the statues are, to me, extremely evocative of a throne room. All right, once again, El Galadwin has the save, and she's saying it's just north of the Stone Hall, you can see the endless stair again. We can't jump to it. That's too bad. What are you going to do? It's what it is. <clears throat> I want to go ahead and apologize uh, deeply and sincerely. I know you all tuned in expecting to see lots of punching happening. And I regret that I didn't punch more Globsnaga and Nameless as we've uh, progressed through Moria here. I know that you all you all just came here to see Usi using these sick Wolverine-esque gauntlets punching orcs in the face. So, but I, I, I will make amends. We will punch a few orcs uh, before the night is done. Uh, one thing that's interesting when we think about geography in Moria is the sheer void of it all, the lightlessness. And now the Lord of the Rings Online, they're very smart when they design this area. We get around the pitch black that is described in the books uh, with all these crystal lamps. And then most importantly, the mirror system. That's something that a lot of quests in this uh, region focus, and this whole expansion really focus on, is the, use, the dwarves' use of mirrors to get light here and there. And then, of course, we got this light shining through, which into the many pillars of the 21st hall, which, if I'm remembering correctly, was was uh, described quite, quite blatantly in the books. Um... Be, and I'm thinking about this in part because... Uh, Tolkien never describes his dwarves as having like night vision, 
or dark vision as they're described in like D and D and other such fantasy properties. Let me check my way. Yeah, we're going the right way. Uh, so then, and um, it's never really alluded to, at least not much. Um, I think, let me see. It's uh, no, I guess I'm not that part of the story yet. It's alluded to in the Kazu Doom chapter where Gimli um, it, it talks about how Gandalf is in the lead and Gimli helps him mostly by his enthusiasm and by the fact that he um, has seized slightly better than the others. And then, of course, in The Hobbit, the dwarves keep it dark, dark for dark business. But short of that... It's not really described how the dwarves see in the dark, or that like contrast. Like like a big deal is made about that in other fantasy properties. Never really made a big deal of in the Lord of the Rings. It's kind of accepted that the dwarves live underground. They have some kind of light sources, and it's what it is. Um, Lotro goes out of its way to kind of explain this with all these mirrors, which we can kind of see here. They're all hands for some reason. Maybe there's some significance there that I've missed as I've clearly missed a lot, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Uh, but yeah, you see all these hands. And then, of course, these massive mirrors. There's the mirror halls of uh, of that dwarvish word, Kulubnar, whatever it was, uh, which was specifically about using the mirrors to kind of cast out the, um, the forces of darkness. And that's kind of their explanation. So I said I missed a lot. Uh, I've literally been playing this game off and on since beta. And there's so much stuff that I miss, which is partly why I like doing this podcast and this show with all of you, because I've literally never seen this before. What is wrong with me? Oh, what's up, DeWitt? Oh my gosh. Y'all, come on. <laughs> I'm not even joking. I've played this, I've been through Moria at least 10 times, and I've never noticed this before. Are you kidding me? Goodness gracious, what an embarrassment. So there you go, we get a close-up view. We saw the bottom of the Endless Stair there in the Foundations of Stone. We saw it again in Nud Melek uh, in the second hall, roughly. And here it is again, right through Durin's Way and Yazergun. Ah, El Galadwin says that she tried... <laughs> she definitely tried to, to make the leap of faith and uh, jump on the endless stair and can tell us with first-hand knowledge that you can't do it. Hopefully you all got your, your deed for jumping in the well in the Chamber of the Crossroads as well. All right, so anyway, here it is, the beautiful endless stair in its third iteration. I think it's time we got to the top. Let's go! Let's go, and then I want to talk about the end of the story, or as much of the end of the story of the dwarves as we know from the text, because um, I, I have a feeling, I don't know this for a fact, but I have a feeling that Gundabad might be the last we hear of the dwarves in the Lord of the Rings online for a while, because we got Moria, we got the Black Book, and the and now, of course, the Fate of Gundabad expansion with all the other things that have led up to it, like Blood of Azog. And it's been very dwarf-centric, for as I said, since 2018, when we first meet Prince Durin. So I have a feeling we're not going to hear from the dwarves in Lotro for a while. Um, doesn't mean it's the last we, we're going to hear of them. Because, if again, if I remember correctly, I think Renania said, based solely on some of the pitches he got from the Lotro team, they've got stories enough for like another decade of expansions and stuff. Which is not terribly surprising. Um, but this may be the last we hear of the dwarves for a while, so I thought it would be an opportune time to talk about what we do know about the ultimate fate of the dwarves and how that kind of ties into Gundabad, which we are uh, fringing upon. Is it next week? Two weeks. Right? November 10th. So yeah, two weeks we're going to be heading to Gundabad. Let's see if we're going the right way. Uh, we are indeed. Can't forget to grab the horse route here on my new guy. And uh, I'll tell you what, I think now's the time for punching. Let's punch some guys. What'd you say to me, Bat? You don't like the new ally system? How do you like that? 
What about you, Moria Defender? You got a problem with traceries? Well, how about one of these? Oof! There we go. And all the goblins of Moria were punched. Let's get one more. What'd you say to me? There we go. So satisfying. All right. Let's check our map one more time. We're getting there. Very good. Oh, it feels good to get the lead out there. Punch a few bad guys in the face. It's also worth talking about the Watcher in the Water, which who played such uh, an integral part in the story. It's not, it reminds me a little bit of Remarkant, the current Shelob raid, because we don't find out what happens to these creatures in the text. And so Lotro kind of gives us a little bit of resolution with some of these stories. But of course the Watcher plays a, an integral role in the whole Volume 2 story, which kind of concludes with us, as usual, beating the crap out of it and sending it off to its its demise. All right, here we are. We have made it to the top. Thankfully, my dwarvish fortitude is keeping me from freezing my my beard off right about now. Let's get a good shot here. Let's see how high we can get up. Oh, I love all these broken broken uh, structures here. I think that's very interesting. I think it's interesting that um, like they could be part of Doran's Tower. They could be part of the Endless Stair. They could be some other outposts of the dwarves. It's not really made specific, and that's okay. All right. Let's get to the good stuff. Let's get to the big show. As I said, Gandalf and Durin's Bane fought from the bottom of the earth and the foundations of stone to the top of the Endless Stair, which is called Durin's Tower, which is way up there. And then as... The books tell us Gandalf smote his enemy's ruin upon the mountainside. And what's left? Well, this is what's left. So that's my headcanon. What about, I don't know about you guys, but my headcanon is that all these chunks are broken bits of Durin's Tower from the battle between Durin's Bane and Gandalf. What do you guys think? Does that sound right? Oof. Let's do it. Reasonable enough. So as Durin's Bane plummeted from Durin's Tower down to the top of Zirak Zigil, he's still there. Looking absolutely terrifying. And I just have to say, one thing this game has done perfectly, I realize I'm a bit of a fanboy, but one thing this game has done absolutely perfectly through its many iterations and change-ups of staff and changes of publisher and changes of developer is they always use that dread mechanic just right. Like, it is absolutely sensible that I would be scared out of my mind just being around the broken corpse of a Balrog. Let's get out of there. That's too spooky. Okay. So let's end with this. What do we know about what comes next for the dwarves? Well, we know that on November 10th, we're going to get the Fate of Gundabad expansion, and it's going to be awesome. But what comes after that for the dwarves? Well, all we really know is that um, based on... I think this is briefly mentioned in the appendices, and then it's also mentioned in the Peoples of Middle-Earth book, uh, that at some point in the Fourth Age, during the Seventh... Our Doran, who we're currently hanging around with and palling around with right now, um, is going to reclaim Moria. So I'm not totally clear on the timeline in Lotro right now. Maybe some of you um, specialists in the chat can help me out. I don't believe the Fourth Age has officially begun. Maybe it began with the wedding. I can't remember off the top of my head. But at some point in the Fourth Age, Doran Seventh is going to reclaim Moria. Um, the dwarf, the orcs are going to be driven out 
and the the hammers of the dwarves will ring once more, and Moria will hopefully, fingers crossed, become Casa Doom yet again. How could this happen? My uh, as I was thinking about this today and preparing for you all, my thought was that perhaps in our version of things in the Lord of the Rings Online, uh, maybe Gundabad and the War of Three Peaks and the mustering of the Gabil Aka is going to somehow lead to Durin's conquest of Khazad-dûm. Now, hopefully, because we all like a happy story, um, and, you know, the dwarves have been kicked around for a few centuries, because don't forget, after Durin's Bane awoke and all the dwarves fled Moria for their lives, they went to Erebor, the Lonely Mountain, only to be kicked out of the Lonely Mountain by Smaug. So things have not gone well for Durin's folk over the last few centuries. So maybe... Um, it's, uh, Doran's gonna turn things around for them. Maybe they're gonna reclaim Gundabad, and maybe Doran and the Longbeards and the Zelruka and the Stout Axes and whoever else shows up is gonna be so pumped up that they're gonna go from one victory to the next and conquer Gundabad and then move on to Moria. And maybe we adventurers will, uh, play a part in that. I don't really know. But that's, that's kind of what I'm rooting for in my headcanon as I think about the dwarves. And I look forward to good to bad, and I think about um, the endless stare. Very good. Well, uh, that's really that's all I got. That's all I got today. Let me get back inside where it's warm before we uh, we sign off here. Actually, you know what we we you know what we really need to do. We got to punch this guy in the face. Bring your pretty face to my fist. That's right. Sit down. <laughs> I'm so stupid. Sorry. All right. Well, everybody, I want to thank you for joining me this evening as I struggle to get through this portal. Let me in. <laughs> it's a great way to end things. I can't even walk through a hole in the earth. Let me in. All right. I'm going to continue to freeze my face off here in the side of Durin's Bane and wish you all a wonderful night. Uh, once again, I'm shoreless, and this has been... Let me in. Whatever. This has been my little research stream for the Beneath Your Feet podcast. Uh, our, um, come on, brain. Our next episode of Beneath Your Feet, right here for the Endless Stare, which you guys all helped me put together, should be up maybe next week. Usually it takes me about a week to write the script and record it. Um, but definitely check it out. You can find that at uh, anchor.fm slash lotro byf. And uh, I've also been working tirelessly to get all of these episodes up on YouTube. So just uh, the link is posted right there. If you want to have a look at my YouTube channel, give me a quick subscribe. Um, I'm not completely done posting the episodes. I got quite a backlog because I've been doing this thing for a while. But there's plenty of content there for you to enjoy. So consider checking me out on YouTube. You can find me on the Twitter at Shoreless Skies. And pretty much everywhere else, I'm Shoreless Skies. Thank you again for joining me. And we'll see you next month in exactly one month, the last Tuesday of the month, for our next Beneath Your Feet research stream. And I hope to see all of you there. Ta-da!